Hi everyone, welcome to a conveyor meetup. So today we have Miguel and Fabian who will be presenting on Forklift 2.0 since it is generally available. There's a lot of excitement going on over here. But before I hand it over to them, just want to go over some housekeeping rules. So I will send out the recording and the slides 24 or 48 hours after this meetup concludes. I usually send it to the email list and I, I usually also post it to the LinkedIn event page, registration page. So you should be able to get it there. If for some reason you're, you're nowhere on, if you're not on any of those, just put, let me know in the chat and I'll make sure I put it wherever it's most convenient for you. Um, aside from that, if you're not already on the conveyor.io email list, you can subscribe at conveyor.io and that's how you'll get both the actual invites to these meetups, that's how you get the recorded and slides, and also that's how you just get tool updates. And speaking of tool updates, we did have our roadmap for the whole, for all the community tools this past Friday. Um, I'll be sure to link to that whenever I send out this recording email slides. Um, and I think that's it. So Miguel, Fabian, it's all yours. Hey, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks a lot. So hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Miguel Pérez Colimno. I'm the product manager for the migration toolkit for virtualization, which is a, the product derived from Forklift, which is a project in conveyor that helps migrate virtual machines from, from different sources to kubevert and conveyor. And uh, Fabian, do you want to introduce yourself? You're on mute, my friend. <laughs> Okay, admitting. Uh -oh. Oh. The can the now do you hear me? No, 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 I can hear you. You were chopping off. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, so my name is Fabien Dupont and I'm the engineering lead for uh, Forklift and MTV. Uh, we work a lot on Forklift because it's our extreme and that's where the, all the code goes first. So um, I'm used to Forklift more than MTV almost. Yeah, so uh, And if you've first, got any right? question, yeah, any technical question, I'm, I may not be able to answer everything in details, but, but most of it. Yeah, maybe 1% you won't be able to answer. <laughs> So okay, let me let me share some slides and and uh, and uh, I'll get started if I may. So I'm sharing my screen. Let me know when you can see it, Fabian. I can see it, Miguel. Okay, so let's get started. First things first, uh, conveyor. Okay, the community of people passionate about helping others modernize and migrate applications to the hybrid cloud, building tools and best practices on how to break down monoliths, adopt containers, and embrace Kubernetes. So we are part of this community, and Forklift is the tool that migrates virtual machines to Kubevert. Okay, Kubevert is a, an extension, if I can call it an extension to Kubernetes that was started in 2017, and already has more than 2,000 stats in, in, in GitHub. So it's, it has a lot of traction. And lately I learned that there's, a, a, there's a, another company that is using Kubevert for, for their own internal uh, project, to, to deliver to customers. So it's already gaining traction. And Forklift, again, is the tool that is going to bring these VMs to Kubevert and Conveyor. So what about the tools that we have in Conveyor? I mentioned Forklift, the one to, to move virtual machines from, from different sources to Kubevert uh, and Kubernetes. Crane to move uh, uh, containers from one Kubernetes cluster to another. Move to Cube, if you happen to have a, an application that is containerized, for example, in Cloud Foundry, and you want to bring it to Kubernetes, you could do it with Move to Cube. Um, tackle, to refactor applications, to, to, to analyze Java applications and, and see which changes need, they need to, be applied, need to be applied to them, to put them in containers. And last but not least, Pelorus, that is used to measure the delivery performance based on the door metrics. On the, if you haven't read the book Accelerate with uh, Jim Kim, uh, I really suggest you to go through it and read it. It's a really good book that is going to explain to you. But I, I have a reference to it right now. So first things first, why? 
Okay. People are like, okay, sometimes when you're doing technical stuff, it's like, why do you do that? It's just, just because I can, but this is not the case. Okay. This has got a very good grounding behind it. And, uh, and the reason to move in VMs to Kubernetes, there are many, many reasons to move VMs to Kubernetes. I'm going to explain some of them. Where do we come from? Okay. We come from, you know, a lot of time ago, you used to have mainframe and you just needed more mainframe to, to deal with your, your computer needs. Then we moved to client server, then to virtualization, then the cloud shift started. But what is this heading to? Okay. Well, what we see is that people want to be cloud native. They want to achieve a cloud native status to have applications that are cloud native and they want to transform to cloud native. They want to have their applications running in containers on Linux with Kubernetes. That's what, what uh, the market, what is, where the market is going, where people are going, where we're all moving towards. You know, so we are looking forward to becoming more, more cloud native, to have more our applications in containers in a ways that are cloud native managed. And the thing is that right now we are in this situation. We're in virtualization and we have many VMs running on virtualization and virtualization is good for managing VMs. But when you start managing projects and you want to do self-provisioning and you want to have containers and you want to have it all together, it's like, look, this is probably not the right place to do it. So when you want to go cloud native, it's like, okay, where do I establish my base camp to achieve the top, to achieve cloud native, okay? So Kubebird is providing you this capability. It's the base camp, okay? The place where you go and you figure out, okay, which path do I follow next? And you follow that path, it may work, it may not work. You can come back to the base camp figure things out until you really manage to go cloud native. So think about Kubebird as the base camp for your workloads in the, to be moved into it before you start uh, trying to, to modernize them to become, uh, to make them fully cloud native, okay? Why? Why do we want to do this? Okay, there are several metrics I mentioned before, you know, that they are measured by Pelorus, which is a, a project in Conveyor that I really, I really encourage you to go and check for it. So these are the four metrics. If you read this book, Accelerate, it's, um, it's, it's, it's written in a pretty scientific manner. It was uh, this, these authors, Nicole Fosgren, Jess Humble and Dean Kim, go through several companies and several use cases and review which are the main metrics that affect uh, the business when you're doing software. So what do you need to improve? Where are you getting uh, benefits? So these are the four metrics, the time for change. When, when this is the time uh, from the moment you create code until the moment it is in production. So the lower the time for change, the more automated you have all the processes to put it in production. Then is the def deployment frequency. So if you have large batches of code, you cannot deploy frequent, frequently. So what do you do? Well, you have to create smaller batches of code and then this uh, enhances the deployment frequency and you can move from making uh, a change every two months or three months to make uh, several changes a day, you know. Then there's the mean time to recovery. Again, automation plays a big role here. So the more automated you have everything, when there's a mistake or there's an issue, or there's a problem, the easier it is to go back to a situation in which things are recovered and running. And then the change failure rate. The change failure rate is uh, the how many changes uh, go to production. So the earlier you figure out changes, the better, the more tests you have, the earlier you do the testing, the better to reduce the the, the failures, the bugs that uh, go to, to production. So these are the four metrics that if you measure them and you improve on them, then you're going to be more useful for, for business, okay? And Kubert and the virtual machines in, in Kubernetes play a very important role in, in this picture. Because when you're moving the, the, the workloads as VMs to Kubernetes, Kubernetes is already providing you a lot of automation, a lot of, of, uh, of, I mean, it's declarative, it's declarative is not imperative. So it's helping you define what do you need and know how do you have to, to reach it. So these metrics are very, uh, are highly improved by Kubernetes. They are highly improved by using, uh, agile. That they are highly improved if you are doing DevOps. And, uh, and again, they are, they are the ones that are telling you if you're doing the things right or, or not. What do we do here? 
conveyor. I said about the projects, the project that we have here, forklift, uh, we are working uh, with, uh, I mean, in, 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 in conveyor, in conveyor, do, we see that IBM, for example, has joined conveyor and they are providing a lot of tools that they are open sourcing so far and they are collaborating a lot with us. And then what we do in Red Hat is that we build supported operators, same way we do with Fedora and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You know, we have Fedora is the upstream, is the community, is where we build the the code where everybody could go there, take it. And then when you want something that is more stable, that is 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 oriented to a specific version that you're using in production, then is when you have the product and this is this is supported by, by Red Hat. And this is what we do here. We build the project forklift and out of forklift we build the product migration to key for virtualization. And of course, anyone else could go get forklift uh, and use it in any way they want to because it's open source. Well, we have reached EA for forklift 2.0. So this is what we are here to announce. Forklift has reached a EA status. We have uh, had a, a beta two months ago, two and a half months ago, and we have reached a EA status uh, two weeks ago. And now Forklift is TA is ready for you to go on and, and test it and, and run it and, and put it to work to move VMs from, from uh, uh, the source provider that right now is only VMware. So if you have a VMware vSphere, you can connect Forklift to vCenter and be able to get the machines. It is intended to be used for migration at scale. So it's not just to migrate one or two VMs. This is intended to migrate hundreds of VMs. Okay. So, the idea is that when you use uh, Qvert, uh, sorry, um, Forklift, you can migrate to OpenShift virtualization or Qvert, these machines, and providing a source and a destination, and then uh, credentials and mapping the infrastructure. So how do you use it? Well, the first thing you need to do is to connect to a provider. There are two kinds of providers, the source and the target. In the source, we have right now VMware, and in the target, we have uh, OpenShift virtualization. So Whenever you install, uh, or you can use it upstream with Qbert. So whenever you install Forklift in Qbert, it will configure the target uh, where it is installed automatically. You have in this example OpenSea virtualization, which is the version of Qbert that we use for testing uh, because it's, it's very convenient to us. It's available and, and we can use it. So you configure the provider, you configure VMware, you provide the credentials, you provide the, the host name for the vCenter, and then it will connect to it. It will it will reveal how many how many hosts are connected to that are managed by that center, the VMs, the networks, the storage domain available. And then it will perform some checks and it will let you know if it's ready or when it's it, it is ready. And then of course you have the target. In this case we're showing OpenShift virtualization, but we're working with so that Forklift works with uh, Qvert, with any Qvert that you can deploy on any Kubernetes. So what we do in there is that, again, you provide the credentials and it's the place where the VMs are going to land. Once you have configured the, the source and target, you have to configure the mappings. So how do we move hundreds of VMs? So the VMs have several resources. Mainly it's the VM itself that is going to provide CPU, then it's this, this networking and storage. So for networking and storage, what we do is that we create mapping. The way mappings work is that when you have a VM in the source, it's going to have its disks uh, uh, stored in some domain, in some storage domain, okay? So we prepare the target uh, environment, that Qbert, and then we configure the storage in Qbert, and then we have to configure the storage so that it's equivalent, more or less, to the storage that we have in VMware in this case, okay? There's going to be more providers. So once we have it uh, configured and we move a VM, that VM has a disk in that storage. The disk is going to be created in the storage that we map as equivalent. Same thing with uh, with uh, networking. A VM is connected to two networks. Then you have to configure some networks in the target and then create the equivalence. You know, network A in source is equivalent to network one in the target. Network B in the source is equivalent to network two in the target. And then when we create the new VM that is going to have all the data that the source VM had, it's going to be connected to the same networks, the, to the networks that we configured as equivalent. And if we extended the VLANs, 
to, to the target platform is going to be connected even to the same networks. Uh, Fabien, do you have any comments here? Anything you would like to add about mappings or providers? No, not really. I think you, you covered it well. Um, here, here we can see that you can prepare the mappings beforehand. And I, I think it's a really handy way of doing that when you uh, when you know really well your infrastructure. You, you have planned everything already, like you've been through a CSV file and you've mapped everything you had in, a, well, probably an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> uh, and, and you've been using that for for planning and now you're ready to create your your mappings you you've assigned every vm every disk to a destination storage based on the per, per well properties of those storage like performance resilience um and in here um what we've seen in in big projects before in, with ims the hist the story we have from ims is that most of the big migrations have that kind of mapping phase where everything is decided and then we roll out the migration. So the storage mappings and network mappings are really well, really good for that. Um, the other aspect is that you can do them on the spot. If you just want to uh, do a, a quick POC or verify that something is working well, you don't have to go to, through all the steps of creating the, the complete mapping, but you can also do it when you create the plan. We're not there yet, but it's also really interesting that you can create the mappings directly when you create the plan, so you can save time if you're doing something quick. Oh yes, that's very convenient. <laughs> also about storage is the cost, you know, <laughs> we have to put the, to take, in, in care, the, take into account the cost of the storage when you're going to map them, you know, it's, you don't want to use the most expensive storage for VMs that are not using it uh, adequately, but yeah. And Miguel, oh, one more thing. Fabian, there is yes. a, there's a related question. I think is close to this. So when you have oh, a VM, great. when you have a VM with several attached disks, how does MTV or forklift react to that? Does it create independent PVCs or one single root disk? Oh, so when when so Miguel, I'm I'm going to take this one, but um, every time for for well, for each disk we have on the source VM, we have a different PVC. So this way, if your VM is attached to uh, let's say a normal performance uh, data store for uh, the operating system, but a high performance data store for the data uh, of your application. Um, if you've done that kind of split, you would have the, the exact same split on the destination if the mapping is done the same way. So if you said, I have a normal data store and I'm mapping that to the standard um, quality of service uh, storage, storage class, and you've done the same for the high performance data store to the high performance storage class, the mapping would be, we will keep that for each disk. Um, right. And that's also one great aspect we have with, with, with MTV. Um, and it's, well, and thanks to the underlying kubevert part, because we're relying on CDI, containerized data importer that is doing that. Each disk is imported separately. So we're maximizing the throughput also during the migration by Parallelizing the um, the disk import to um, to OpenShift. So yeah, each disk goes into its own PV uh, and PVC. Um, so we we can keep that kind of separation afterwards. Yeah, there's one one thing that uh, that you did, uh, and I, I mean the engineers that I like it a lot. I mean, there's a, a way to select the network that is going to be used for migration. So one thing that can be done is that you create a, a network just for migration. So you make yourself sure that we're not going to impact any production workload by, by I mean, making the most of that network that is going to handle the migration. Is that right, Fabian? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. And it's exactly what we uh, recommend. Um, the same way as any virtualization platform would, would recommend a dedicated uh, network for the storage or another another one for the backup usually you don't use the same one for the backup and for the storage because you actually don't want to um generate penalty on the on the main storage network or, or have interference from the backup itself even though mm -hmm. at some point you're still transferring the data so you need to read them 
but but through a, through a control channel which is the ESXi um, on the VMware side or the Rev host on the Rev side. So next step, okay, migration plan. So once you have everything prepared, all the mappings in place, uh, did I miss anything, Fabian, by the way? No, no, thank you. No? Good. Okay, so migration plans. So in the migration plans, we we have a, a, another feature that is tech preview right now, which is uh, the validation service, which is going to do the pre-migration checks, okay? So there's a service that is going to check the VMs, and uh, I mean, I mean uh, Fabien mentioned IMS. IMS was uh, uh, the infrastructure migration solution that we built uh, some years ago, and we used to migrate uh, from VMware to rehabilitation. We learned some that uh, in some cases, some VMs required some manual intervention. Like, for example, let's say that you have a pretty large VM that is using a lot of memory, and you don't want to use different NUMA banks because it will have a tremendous penalty on the performance. So if the VM has NUMA pinnings, you will have you will want to have a warning. So this is one of the rules that we have is like, okay, if you have NUMA pinnings, CPU pinnings, then you will know that uh, this VM will require some some uh, extra care in order to be migrated. Or for example, if you have shared disks, or if you have Robby device mappings and other circumstances that will, that will uh, make you want to review the VM before doing the migration, uh, we are going to, to warn you before running the, the, the plan, before running the migration, so you can do the steps that you need to do in order to make the migration successful. We don't want to run uh, migrations that fail, so we're doing all that we can. So we can warn before, uh, before uh, executing the migration and, and avoid issue. So there's these pre-migration checks that are done before the migration when you are running a migration plan and you're selecting the VMs and they're going to be shown there. So why, once you see the VMs, you can select them. And then, of course, you will assign the network mappings, the storage mappings, you will review them, and you will be able to complete the, the migration. And then, uh, as my friend Marco Berube likes to say, sit down, sit back and relax, okay? So once the migration has started, you, you will be able to check the status of it, you will be able to see the what is the state in the in which each single VM is is right now. If they are being transferring, if they are converting the image, or if they are completed, or if there's been any issue. So you just uh, again sit sit back and relax and let the the migration happen. This is a bit of the forklift architecture. So Fabian, did you want to go through this one? Yes, yes. Um, so um, on this one, you can see on the left, the VMware, this VMware provider. Um, the notion of provider is basically here to, um, as a way for us to keep the credentials and the API endpoint for each provider, like the source VMware and the destination of the virtualization. Um, in the whole process, the provider is, is is mainly useful, as I said, for the connection, but then we have the CRs, the, the concept Miguel mentioned, like the mapping, the migration plan, and the migration run CR. Um, so everything is, everything in, in Forklift is um, an operator. We are extending the Kubernetes API with our own custom resources definitions. Um, so we have mapping, migration plan, and migration run. So the migration run is an occurrence of the migration plan execution. So here, what happens is, once you've de defined your provider, you go, you have the full inventory. So we have also an inventory, the provider and inventory service, who's going to connect to VMware, OpenShift virtualization, gather all the information about the uh, the host, the networks, well, the data stores, um, all the VMs. It's going to um, allow you to generate your mappings because you know you have the list of source and destinations, networks and storages, and then you create your plan from the list of VMs. So that's what Miguel sh has shown. And when you click on start from, for a plan, it's going to create a migration run CR. And that migration run will actually trigger uh, the generation of a VM import CR. The VM import CR itself 
it belongs to uh, the VM import operator that we usually call VMIO in short. Um, and it's part of the kubevert uh, hybrid converged operator. So kubevert itself is running VMs, but the, the more global ecosystem that uh, the hyper converged operator uh, is, so it's another layer on top of kubevert, actually has another operator for VM import operator. This one is going to connect to VMware, gather more information about the VMs, read what's inside the, the mapping, and generate the VM you are on the OpenShift utilization side. So this one is responsible for connecting to uh, the Kubert API, Kubert API, generating the VM. And when the VM is created, uh, it will it will trigger the transfer of the disk. So everything is was already present in um, in Kubert, which is super cool for us because we could leverage that when we did, created Forklift. So we've we've win a lot of time on that. Um, the other aspect that Miguel mentioned about the 2.0 uh, release is that we have at the top here, top right, is a validation service. So uh, additionally to um, the provider inventory service, we also have a validation service, that, which is basically a rule engine based on open policy agent. So um, people usually know open policy agent in the in the Kubernetes ecosystem. It's, it's mainly used for um, validation webhooks, uh, or well, validation admission webhooks. And basically here, we're using it slightly differently. So the provider inventory is going to send the details about the VM in the uh, on the VMware side. And it's going to verify a number of rules, like does it have SRIOV uh, and enable network, networking, uh, network interfaces, sorry. Um, does it have uh, raw device mapping? Is it connected to um, I don't know, an OPAC network? OPAC network in VMware world is NSX. So all these rules are going to be checked, and we we label the VMs with those with the result of this uh, rule engine. So then we can expose in the UI the concerns we have about the migration. So we can give you uh, an overview of how the migration is going to happen. Will it go well? Do we have any uh, unknown, uh, or do we even recommend not doing the migration because we know some features are not available in Apache virtualization? Because Apache virtualization is not met, meant to be a replacement for VMware; it's a brand new virtualization platform. So we haven't, we are not in a competition with VMware. We're providing a virtualization platform that, on OpenShift to allow you to allow customers. Uh, and users to mo to modernize their applications. So, with that in mind, we are not going for one on one one to one relationship with VMware features. And sometimes some VM will not migrate just using forklift. They may require some manual intervention, like Miguel said. So, with all that information, the validation well, the validation service is providing that insights uh, to help users to decide whether the VM is a good fit for OpenG virtualization. Um, and at the center, we've got the controller pod, um, which is the orchestrator. One of the things we've implemented in, um, in Forklift is throttling, for example. We know that uh, VMware ESXi doesn't allow us to do more than about 20 connections, concurrent connections to the VDDK service. Any backup solution or any backup vendor for VMware knows that. Uh, we know it too. So we are throttling the number of connections. And, and the previous question from Joel was, um, is there, uh, is any, every disk in its own PV? That's true. Each disk is its own PV, which will also mean that during the transfer of the disk, for each disk, we will have a connection to the ESXi. But we need to make sure that we don't go beyond those 20 connections. Um, so we have that mechanism and all that orchestration is done by the controller. And I think that's mainly it. Um, is there any question on that? So somewhat related, Fabian. Um, so this is a couple questions. 
Yeah. The first question is, is there a max supported size retro machine to migrate? Um, I think there is a maximum support size uh, on the CubeVet side, but I don't know exactly how much it is. To be completely transparent, that's a limitation on the CubeVet side. Um, I think it's fairly okay. high. Um, it's because we're using the same technology as uh, the one we have in Overt, um, I would expect it to be really close to the maximum in Overt. But we would have to, do, to double check on that one. Okay, and then the other question is, what are the supported operating system? Linux RHEL and Windows only? Um, no, we go beyond RHEL. Uh, well, mainly because we're in community environment. Uh, so if you if you're using the uh, the enterprise version MTV uh, from a support point of view, really support like you you're opening a support case with Red Hat, uh, you would have lim a limited support for some operating systems um, like old versions of Windows, uh, some um, well many Linux are supported, uh, but some some old versions of Linux are not supported also. Uh, from the forklift point of view, everything that uh, Vert V2V supports uh, is supported too. Um, that's one aspect I didn't mention here on that architecture because it's not very easy to to show. Is once we've com once we've transferred the disks uh, to OpenShift virtualization, there is one step we need to to do. Um, it's running Vert V2V. Because the VM was running on VMware, so the the hypervisor was different. The, the drivers inside the VMs may not be enough to run. Well, the VM may not have the right drivers for OpenShift virtualization. Um, so by running Vert V2V with all the disk attached, like we have a specific pod that runs uh, with with Vert V2V, and it's going to convert the operating system, making sure that it can run on KVM, basically. Um, so that stage uh, requires that the operating system is known by Vert V2V and, and supported by Vert V2V. That's going to be the main limitation. And then um, KubeVert may not support some old operating system due mainly due to the chipset support. It's only running Q35 uh, chipset. So some old operating system may not support it. Thank you. Yeah, Richard uh, Richard Jones put some useful stuff in the in the chat for anyone that may need a little bit more context and and for everyone well, else. You. Hello, uh, Rich, and thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, for everyone else, so like a lot of the questions that we have right now are more about the roadmap. So I'll hold off on that and let you guys get through those slides because then you're going to address that. Okay. Fabien, do you want to add anything about the architecture? Um, no, no. Um, well, one thing is we provide a UI. You see that there's a UI pod, but everything is is available as an API too. Like the UI is really a way for us to give it the user experience, as Miguel has shown. Uh, the user experiences are our, our opinionated uh, representation of what the workflow should be. Uh, but if you want to do some migration at scale and you have your own automation, like for example, you're running a CSV from Ansible and you want to create the, uh, the CRs directly with, with Ansible, it's absolutely possible. I mean, what I like a lot is that it's completely integrated into Kubernetes. You know, the custom resources, the pods, everything is completely integrated into Kubernetes. One detail here, I mean, the target is obviously virtualization is what we used to test normally, but I mean, yeah, we're working so that it's ready for Kubert and Kubernetes. So if you're using vanilla Kubert uh, on, on Kubernetes, it will work the same. Plus, obviously virtualization is our distribution of OpenShift that includes Kubert. So, Let's say that we are very focused on on being uh, work, being able to work with upstream at any time and to make this available for any other use case that any any person or any other company would figure out 
that it could uh, help them. So uh, j just a detail. So move, moving on, roadmap. <laughs> oh, the roadmap, where are we heading to? What have we done? Okay, we have launched 2.0 and uh, we have added one feature that I haven't mentioned so far, which is warm migration. Warm migration is, is just a, a way that in which we can copy the data of a VM while it's still running. Okay? So to do that, what, what we do is that we, we create a special kind of snapshot. It's called CBT snapshot for change plot tracking. So this snapshot is, is used by, by many, like I think probably every single backup tool for, for VMware is using that. So we are just doing behaving like any other backup tool. So any question about will this work with VMware? Well, if your backup tool works with VMware, it's very likely that uh, Forklift is going to work with VMware too. So we do the same thing that uh, backup uh, vendors do. We create a, a change block tracking snapshot. We copy the data, and once the data is copied, there's a second stage which we call cut over, in which the VM is shut down. The changes to the disk that weren't copied were, will be copied at this moment. Of course, it will be a lot less, and then they will power up the VM in the target. This is intended to reduce the time to migrate, and of course, if you have an intervention window to do the migration, you will be able to migrate more VMs in the same allocation uh, intervention window. And then the second thing that we have added that we have already talked about are the pre-migration checks, the tech preview for this version. So, uh, um, Jonathan, there were questions around roadmap. Do you want to bring them up now? Yes, I, I can. Ahead. Yeah, so the first one is, um, and I think this will actually be further on your roadmap. Is there an option, a roadmap, to import VMs from OpenStack to OpenShift? Uh, okay. Uh, virtualization? Yeah, that's that's coming, yeah. So, and then... Uh, do you want to elaborate yeah. more on that, or do you want to go to the next I, question? I will elaborate in the next slide. Yeah, tell me more. Okay. And then the other question is, is there a roadmap for a rev provider, given the fact that we position, I think, OpenShift virtualization as a successor of rev? If so, what is so, the ETA? Okay. So uh, we have Forklift 2.1 to, in, to include rev provider. Okay. But the initial implementation will be cold migration only. This means you shut down the VM, you copy all the data, you power up the VM. That's how cold migration works. And this is the implementation that we'll have in Forklift 2.1. And then in Forklift 2.2, we'll include warm migration. So in Forklift 2.1, we're also going to include migration hooks, which is a capability that could uh, run a, a container that you provide to be able to run tasks before migration, in pre-migration, or after the migration, in post-migration, uh, to automate things like, for example, if you want to remove an agent from the from the VM before migrating it, or you want to add an agent after this migrated, and also, for example, for things that are outside of the VM, like the VM is uh, is uh, being monitored, and you don't want to receive 200 alerts because it's being powered down, so you can deactivate monitoring. Uh, in a pre-migration hook, migrate the VM and then reactivate the monitoring. You could do some pre-migration text testing extra by yourself that you can run pre-migration and then verify that everything is okay. And then once the migration is, is completed, you could also run checks to verify that the VM is running okay. So this is what migration hooks. Related to your question, Jonathan, on REF, in 2.2 is when we're going to add war migration, when we plan to add war migration to, to, to the capability of migrating from ref or overt. So this is, this is, uh, this is going to do the same, to implement the same behavior we have for VMware to be able to create a change log tracking snapshot and then copy the data, power down and copy the changes. We're also going to add an image builder for Ansible hooks. So if you're going to run some pre-migration or post-migration tasks and you're going to use a container to run them, we're going to provide you a way to build an image of a container with your Ansible playbooks. So you just have to provide a Git repository with your Ansible playbooks and the branch that you want to use 
and we will build the image for you and then you can use that image to run pre or post migration uh, tasks uh, to your to your VMs or the the related infrastructure. And then in two that we want to do pre migration checks GA we want to bring them to GA. We will be adding OpenStack support two that three okay basic support is what we're going to be added and it's going to be basic very basic support to migrate VMs from from OpenStack to OpenShift virtual system. You were also asking when, okay, this is the timeline that we are expecting to have. And I say expecting, okay, there's a lot of things to be done and there are, there will be many unknown unknowns that may cause us to sleep some of these dates or not. But uh, right now the planning is that for lift to that one with support for rep migration and migration hooks uh, will arrive on, on August, 2021. And uh, for link 2.2 uh, with a worm migration for rehabilitation and overt will arrive in November, as same as with the pre-migration checks as GA and the Ansible Hooks Image Builder. And uh, February next year, we want to have uh, to have the basic OpenStack support. Are there any other questions about roadmap, Jonathan? No, the the only other one was answered by Fabian, so you're good to go. Okay, so I think this was it. Um, uh, we have some videos here in this URL that is super short, and it's funny because it goes MTV videos. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, so it's red.ht slash MTV does videos. We have some videos there that you could go through them uh, to view how to do an installation and, and how to use uh, uh, MTV. We are rebuilding our demo lab so um, whenever it's completed, I will record new videos with the new features and I will keep adding them to this uh, video list. But uh, right now, Fabian, do you want to do you want to share your screen and, and show uh, how our migration is performed? Sure, sure. Um, OK, let, let me let me share my screen and tell me Can if you can see it. my screen. All yours. The stage is yours. Do, do you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so that's a demo. You can see that it's mixed migration toolkit for virtualization with the conveyor logo. Um, it's, a, it's done from an upstream build that still had that migration toolkit there. But anyway, um, here I'm going to show you how we do migration from VMware to um, open to virtualization. Would be the same with Kubert. Uh, and as Miguel explained, we have a, the first step is to add a provider. So here we just select VMware as a source. Uh, we put the credentials and we add the provider. This adds a new tab on the window and you can see the details. So we have 47 VMs, 13 networks, and then we just go and create a migration plan. So here, just click demo. With the description, select the provider. So I'm selecting the provider I just created. And for the destination, I'm, I'm using host. Host is actually the uh, OpenShift cluster where uh, Forklift is running. Then from there, I've selected the namespace where I want to put the VM. And then I can go to select the VMs I, I want to migrate. So here I'm selecting them by folder. Um, let me just pause for a second and go back. Um, here for people using VMware, you, you would be um, you you wouldn't be lost because you, you will find the cluster and host view and the folder view, which are the main ones if you most VMware administrators are using in the uh, VC console. So um, the one for that is using cluster and host basically shows you the um, the data center. Um, Technical architecture, how the how the hosts are um, well uh, aggregated in clusters inside data centers. So that's a good way when you know exactly where the VM is located. Um, we that's the the other as, the other one is folders, and this one is more logical view. Um, here for you can see that we have 
put our VMs in folders such as infrastructure, templates, uh, V2V, uh, workloads. Here are more about how do we organize the VMs from a logical point of view. Um, many customers are using uh, or organizations such as uh, by BU, then by application from the BU, and then you find all the VMs there. Uh, you also find an organization where you can find uh, application servers, uh, databases, stuff like that, depending on the view you want to, that suits you best. So here I'm using the, the folder view, and I'm getting all the VMs in the in that data center because I know exactly which one I want. So then I can select my VMs, and you you can see that I can either go through the pages, um, but also at the top we we have yeah we have a filter. Uh, the filter field allows you to filter by VM name. Convenient, easy, but you can can also filter them by folder. Uh, so the folder path you can see here, um, or by host. Exactly the same kind of stuff we, we have before, but for example, you say, I know my VMs are in this specific folder, and they're also under the, um, on this host, because I want to um, evacuate a specific host. So I'm the application owner, I got the maintenance window, and I know that I, I have to move my VMs away from that, uh, from the host, because it's going to be repurposed maybe as an OpenShift node. Um, so, here I'm picking my VMs. You can see they are named after me, F. Dupont. Uh, I'm not testing a Windows VMs. That was one of the questions. Here I don't have a mapping. As I mentioned, you can do it on the spot. I'm doing that very easily, selecting the pod network. It's a very simple environment, so there's no uh, multi-test network with VLANs. Um, and I using the standard storage class. Nothing fancy, but you can see that in a few steps, I already have a plan and I'm starting a migration. We can see the details of the migration by just clicking on it. And for each VM, we, we can see the steps. So Miguel mentioned that we're going to have a migration hooks. So the, the, the steps are going to be, the, the pipeline here is going to be longer than just two steps. We're going to have pre-migration and post-migration hooks. Uh, we can also easily add new steps, uh, whatever we want with, 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 I think, an interesting view um, that is looking like pipelines in Jenkins or stuff like that. And you have all the information about the migration. So here we've, we can see that copying the data for that Windows machine took an hour and a half. Uh, don't be afraid, that's a small VM, but it's a very, very slow environment. It's nested virtualization and nested virtualization. So um, you, you can really expect better performance. Daniel is there and he, we have really, really high performance on, on the migration. Um, so Daniel, I mentioned, is our QE, um, QE manager. And he has, the team has run a performance test. We are reaching, I think, uh, 800, uh, megabytes per second on a 10 gig network, so it's, it's fairly well. Um, so here you can see I've, I'm starting the VMs, and I can just go in the console tab of that specific VM and see it boot. You can see it's so a Windows, I'm selecting the one we should be the less comfortable with being working for Red Hat. Um, and well, it ends kind of abruptly, but at the end you can see that uh, you've got the welcome screen of Windows. Um, and actually, we can log into the VM. Um, there's an option on, on the console in OpenShift to uh, send the control al uh, signal. So migrating is migrating VM is really easy. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, um, you can also automate all of that Using the API if it's, if it's a better, um, fit for you. Or the UI can help you build your migration plans, even very large ones, uh, if it's easier from, from a UI point of view. Miguel, I think it, that's all I have. So I have a couple of questions here. 
um, but we are getting close to 12. So just want to let, let everyone know in case you have to leave. I did put the link to a survey in the chat. If you fill that out, that allows us to know like what we need to double down on, what we need to get stop doing. And also, I did put the link to the Slack channel. So after this, if you have any more questions, you can just go in there and and ping Fabio and Miguel, and they'll be able to to help you out. Um, Fabio and Miguel, a question that came up is: given that the migration itself runs on OpenShift, is there a way to limit the amount of resources it will use? Um, yeah, it's it's fairly easy to do from a, a CPU and memory point of view. Um, we can use li um, requests and limits. Um, and, and actually, what we we are not formally using it right now, um, but it's on it's on the internal technical roadmap to allow that um, on the CDI side. So CDI is the, is the component that is doing the disk transfer. So for example, we could we could set some annotation on the uh, on on the for each disk and say, hey, I don't want to consume more than this amount of disk and memory. Well, mainly the memory, and the um, the importer pod would self limit the the memory on, on that. By default, we're using. Um, I think we're still using the, the the default setup. It's about one gigabyte of memory per disk transfer. Um, it's mainly due to the number of uh, so the, the the transfer is asynchronous depending on the um, on the VMware version, but it can be asynchronous, and we have. Uh, I think eight as asynchronous um, calls, and then the amount of memory per call gives you the math to the uh, to the consumed memory. So it's it's not very expensive for the migration. Uh, usually, the VM is going to consume more when it starts. Okay. Awesome. Uh, from a, from a net networking point of view, that's a main challenge, and I think it's a challenge for everyone using uh, Kubernetes. How do we limit the amount of network we consume in a pod? Um, as soon as we've got a solution for Kubernetes, more generally, we can use it for uh, for forklift. Got it. And if you and if you have a solution for that, please please put that <laughs> in the comments. I'd be happy to use it. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so that that's one thing I would say, everyone. If if by if you have any if you have any ideas or contributions or just ideas for contributions, please put that in the Slack channel. I know we're always looking for more things to do. But Fabio, Miguel, those were the only those are the only questions that I had. Miguel, you answered the last one, um, so thank you for doing that. And to everyone else, that concludes today's meeting. So or, or meetup. So. Again, just feel free to ping ping everyone on the Slack channel if you have any more questions, and I will send out the recording and slides probably 24, 48 hours after this. So, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Bye, guys.